You're watching Tag TV. You're watching Tag TV. Aziz Hormatli Brotherum, Uzbekistan Jamur Reis, Shaukat Mirzayev, Ruxat Tingiz Bilan. Mamnun Miz Sizna Yukari Darajadiki. Mehman Shuldi Nizuchun. President Mirzayev, Prime Minister Khan, Mr. Borel, distinguished ministers, heads of international and regional organizations, ladies and gentlemen, friends. Dictionary definitions of connectivity are dominated by the means by which individual terminals, computers, mobile devices, and local area networks connect to the global network. Digitalization, artificial intelligence, and Internet of Things and the converging technologies of the fourth industrial revolution are accelerators that are likely to make 2030 radically different from 2021. The world is on a speed. Each of the preceding three industrial revolutions were also deeply transformative of space, time, and power relations between regions of the world and within states. A major difference is that the Eurasian continent, this time, is a central hub of these accelerators, making the transformation of the Eurasia from a geographic notion to a continental economy, one of the most significant transformations of the 21st century. With the reset, caused by COVID-19, it is clear that regions and states are going to loom large in all of our lives. For millennia, connectivity referred to human relationships and networks established through the medium of culture and civilization, allowing people to establish reference points for identities in cooperation and opposition with others. As the first and second industrial revolutions provided the tools for subjugation of large parts of the earth, cultures became arenas of confrontation. The possibility of combined development opened up by the fourth industrial revolution can provide the needed accelerations for a more equal world. But if our regions miss the opportunity during the next decade, the gap will be much wider. This open moment, like all such moments, is therefore a mixture of opportunities, risks, turbulences, and threats. How the region deals with the opportunities and challenges, defining the context in Afghanistan after the departure of the U.S. and NATO forces could have a significant impact on the process of regional cooperation or confrontation. My week of July 8 to 15 offers us a window to the opportunities and challenges captured through my interactions with my fellow Afghan men and women in Kabul and the provinces that I visited. The opportunities can be summed up as follows. First, the U.S. and NATO partners have left behind considerable assets, provided concrete commitments in assistance and support, and are framing the future as a new partnership in the relationship. Mr. Borrell, I thank you. Bagram Airport, which I visited on the 9th, alone has an estimated $3 billion worth it used to be the busiest airport in the world for 10 years in a row. We plan to turn Bagram and other military airports into hubs of trade and connectivity. The investments made by our people, as illustrated by my visits to the thriving cities of Khost in the east, 
in Mazar Sharif in the north provide for, li for lives with dignity. Our people have put all their resources into creating livelihoods for themselves and a platform for education of poverty and living with dignity. Second, as a state, we are dedicated to a clear vision of peace, stability and prosperity through internal reforms and regional cooperation. Our reforms ranging from digitalization of the government to the overall of our budget and revenue to construction of major irrigation and development projects or in implementation. I was delighted to welcome 161 people on the first direct flight from the UE to the brand new airport in Khost, a dream come true on the 10th. I associate myself with President Mirzaev's full proposals for regional projects. Third, as a people in state, pursuit of a political settlement to the conflict with the Taliban has been our national priority. The end state of a sovereign, united, democratic, peaceful, and connected Afghanistan has been endorsed internationally and regionally. We have offered a clear roadmap, particularly in my article in the Foreign Affairs, consisting of making peace, forming a government of peace, and sustaining peace through the will of the people, meaning there must be elections to elect my successor to the highest office in the land. We are building consensus for the permanent neutrality of Afghanistan, and we need your support for this. Fourth, the enabling legal environment for utilization of our nat natural wealth, ranging from mining, oil and gas, to renewable energy and geothermal, hydro, solar, and wind has been created. We are talking not about megawatts, but gigawatts of energy. We announced the award of a series of mining contracts on the 8th of July and finalized the processes of procurement of over 100 construction contracts on the 10th of July. Fifth, the Islamic Republic as a constitutional system of government and the Afghan National Defense and Security Forces if strong public support. Thanks to technology, I've been interacting with governors and defense and security officials across the country on an hourly basis to concentrate our forces in strictly practice economy of effort. I'm delighted that recruitment to our all volunteer forces is considerably up. How are the threats manifesting themselves? First, while the third wave of COVID-19 pandemic is threatening our lives, in a severe drought threatening our livelihoods, Taliban have unleashed a destructive wave of attacks across the country. Contrary to the commi their commitment to the U.S. to pursue a political solution, they have deployed the over 5,000 prisoners released at the request of the international community by the Luajirga or Grand Council as the vanguard of these attacks. Over 50 of the largest drug dealers released at international request provide financial backing for the onslaught. Second, destruction of public assets as manifested by the destruction of over 260 buildings and systematic looting of public assets mark their trail of destruction. Reliance on car bombs, massive planting of landmines, assassination campaigns, targeted killings of women, and civil society leaders in summary execution of prisoners of war constitute their arsenal. These practices are forcing hundreds of thousands of people to flee. to cities in secure provinces. The only choice offered by the Taliban is that of submission and surrender. Third, intelligence estimates indicate the influx of over 10,000 jihadi fighters from Pakistan and other places in the last month, as well as support from their affiliates 
in the transnational terrorist organization. There's a consensus among credible international observers that they've not taken any steps to sever their relationship with terrorist organizations. Fifth, contrary to the declarations of their political office that they will not attack cities and provincial centers, they are accelerating their attacks in attempting to starve the cities. Fifth, contrary to the repeated assurances by Prime Minister Khan and his generals that Pakistan does not find a Taliban takeover in Afghanistan in Pakistan's interest, in short of use of force, will use its power to influence to make the Taliban negotiate seriously. Networks and organizations supporting the Taliban are openly celebrating the destruction of the assets and capabilities of the Afghan people and state. What does this balance sheet imply for Afghan people and government and our regional partners? We, the people and government of Afghanistan, are fully focused on the present moment and determined to ensure our existence as a nation and a state. Relying on the will of Allah and based on the deep reservoir of patriotism, we are confident that we can change the challenge to opportunity. Based on the principles of concentration of forces and economy of effort, were prepared to face the Taliban and their supporters for as long as it takes until they realize that a political solution is the only way forward. Given the lessons of Algeria, Iraq, Lebanon, Syria, and Yemen, among others, we wish to preempt the descent to the hell of an all-out war. We therefore call on the Taliban to engage with the government of Afghanistan to end the war in the destructive recent onslaught. Also, we call on Pakistan to use its influence and leverage for peace and cessation of hostilities. To mark our differences with the Taliban, we will accelerate our reforms in state building, market building, and peace building. We are committed to international humanitarian law and will mobilize our national response under the leadership of the Afghan National Defense and Security Forces. And as far as the theme of today's conference, we will accelerate our efforts on enhancing the consensus on regional connectivity, both in terms of hardware and software, the rules and relationships and rule of law that is required for accelerating the design and implementation of programs and projects of regional connectivity. From the region, first and foremost, we request a sense of urgency. Lessons learned are clear. Without regional consensus and support, peace does not break out. Please approach Afghanistan from the perspective of our potential as an Asian roundabout where for millennia we have functioned as a hub for flows of civilization, cultures, goods, ideas, and people. We don't ask for sympathy, but for clear definition of your interest in enduring the stability and prosperity of your own countries and people and finding mechanisms for convergence with our interest. Embracing regional connectivity and support for a political support a pathway to walk back the Taliban and their supporters from the brick of dissent to hell is a win-win-win approach. To plunge Afghanistan into all-out war is to plunge the region into radical uncertainty. Pakistan, therefore, needs to be engaged coherently and urgently from the perspective of regional interest. The Afghan people have entrusted me with the honor to be the servant of the nation. They expect me to represent them with dignity and logic, becoming a proud people who've always defied predictions of colonial officials, generals, and pundits on our eminent demise and doom. Permit me, however, to make one thing clear. 
while our people in government are fully committed to peace under my leadership, our national security forces will uphold our patriotic duty to defend our people and land. After all, the tree of liberty is often sustained by the blood of patriots. Thank you. Subscribe Tag TV YouTube channel and press the notification button.